let's go through a superposition state. And that would look something like this. So I have my wave function, and I've written this as phi 1 plus phi 2 over square root of 2. What does this mean? Well, we use phi when we're talking about the energy eigenstates, so this is important. Sometimes you can choose your own notation, but the inherent notation we're using here is that psi is a general wave function and that phi are the energy eigens eigenstates. So why square root of 2? That's important. We assume that these states are normalized, and so when we create our new wave function, that also needs to be normalized. So you can kind of think about this as saying, well, it's, it's spin up plus spin down. That would have to be over square root of 2. So how, how can we understand this? Well, if this is a function of position in one dimension for the infinite well, we know what the functional forms of these are. And so then this ends up being 1 over the square root of L, which is coming from the normalization of these originally, and that, that square root of 2 is taking out the square root of 2 that's normally on top. And then we have the first one. Because it is phi sub 1, that is your n equals 1 eigenstate, so this is just pi x over L. And then that second one is phi 2, so that's 2 pi x over L. Okay, so this is, this is our wave function. It's a superposition state of our first and our second energy. So this is a state where we could say, well, what's our expectation value of energy? What's our expectation of position? What's our expectation value of momentum? So let's do momentum. So if I say, what is my expectation value of momentum? That is taking my wave function and doing a bra cap with my momentum operator in the center. Now remember that when we write the bra form of our wave function, that needs to be complex conjugate. However, right now, this is all real. And in particular, we're not thinking about how this is varying in time. Time variation will be the first place where we really start introducing some of those com um, complex terms. So what do, what do we do here? Remember that when we go to convert this, this has to be an integral from negative to infinity, negative infinity to infinity, right, of psi star, and then that operator, which is negative i h bar d dx of psi dx. So the key here is to remember, because we're in the infinite well, when we've written this, this is in fact only true for when x is greater than 0 and less than l, else we say that psi is equal to 0. So that's kind of implicit here. I haven't written that out explicitly. So while we've written the integral this way, when we go to actually now plug this in, we would just say this is the integral from 0 to L. And so the first thing I'm going to do is write this representing that psi star. Now remember, again, it's all real, so we don't have to do that complex conjugate. But always keep that in your mind. You will need it later. 2 pi x over L, definitely going to run out of space on the board. And then we have negative i h bar d dx. Now that d dx acts to the right. So that has to go onto the next line just for the sake of space. 1 over square root of L sine pi x over L. This just takes a whole lot of time to write. You'll get very sick of writing these things over and over again. Okay, and then dx at the end. Okay, so now we can pull out in front a negative i h bar over l, because I have a square root of l, one over square root of l, and another one over square root of l. And then we have to actually apply this d dx to these terms. So I'm going, my integral has become 0 to l. And I still have my original term on the left. So sine of pi x over L plus sine of 2 pi x over L. I am going to have to switch colors so you have a chance of seeing this. Sorry for switching in the middle. Now, one thing to be careful of if you go, oh, this is too much work, can we just use symmetry? First, do that derivative. Don't try to simplify anything until you've taken the derivatives. So now I have my derivative. What is d dx of sine of pi x over l? Well, so my pi over l comes out in front, right? 
and then I'm going to get cosine, right? So that cosine is going to be uh, cosine of pi x over l, okay? And then I'm going to have, and I'm looking at my notes because I feel like there's a minus sign I've dropped somewhere. It's in the derivative, no, it's not. Hmm. I wonder where that minus sign went to. Um, and then I have plus, and now I have 2 pi over L. Uh, derivative of sine is going to become cosine of 2 pi x over L. And that's the x. So now we can look at this, and you see that in fact you're going to have four terms, right? Because we have two terms added here and two terms added here. So there's two approaches to take here. One is to multiply it all out and really do the integral. Another approach is to actually use the symmetry arguments. So I don't have a lot of space left on the board and I don't want to make this video too long. Doing out all of the math gets me to, let's see, gets me about two and a half pages later. So first, let's think about the symmetry arguments. I have zero to L, and over that range, I have something that's like sine of pi x over L. So sine isn't always going to have the same symmetry, depending on what those terms are on the inside. Same for cosine. So the symmetry argument is a little bit tricky here, and you would have to really sketch it out and say, what do these look like? Um, because if what you have is 0 to L sine of pi x over L, that's going to look like that, right? So this is that first one. So then if I have 2 pi x over L, that looks more like this. So you can see that those have different symmetries over that center point. So when we go to do cosine, it's the same thing. You have different symmetries. So to use symmetry arguments, you would really have to multiply that out, look at each four of the terms, and then argue what those symmetries are. Some of them are going to go away. So that is a nice way to do it. The second approach, or really kind of a mixed approach here, is to say, well, okay, I'm going to have four terms. Um, in each case, we're going to have a sine term times a cosine term. Now, when you look in the um, integration table, there's a certain integral that you're given when the argument inside the sine and the cosine is the same. Then there's a different argument for when, there's a different answer for when they're not the same. So one to know is that sine of ax cosine of ax dx equals 1 over 2a sine squared of ax. So you'd use this when the arguments are the same. A different one that's more complicated is when you have sine of mx cosine of nx, in this case not the same, equals negative cosine m minus n x all over 2 m minus n so you can see you can't use this because this would become zero if they're the same. Minus cosine of m plus n, again going off the screen, x, and then all over 2 m plus n. So you would have four terms. Two of them would have the same argument and you could use this for. Two of them would have the different argument and you can use this for it. So if you don't see how to use symmetry arguments, you can use these. Once you use symmetry arguments, just be careful and really draw it out so you know what it is. Normally we say sine is odd sy symmetry, cosine is even symmetry, but that's around zero. In this case, your integral is zero to L, so you'd really want to ask about that L over two point. So those are the two techniques to use here. The answer, in the end, is in fact zero. And so that's part of how these symmetry arguments are helpful in that when we're working towards an answer, some of these terms go to zero, and in fact, a lot of them are going to in this case. 
So please consider um, using symmetry arguments, and in this case, the final answer you would get using either of these is that it's zero.